Metropolitan Soterios of Toronto, and Exarch of All Canada, Your Eminence Metropolitan Ambrosius of Korea, Your Grace and dear friend Bishop Ilya, who was the parish priest in Somerville, Massachusetts, where my grandparents church themselves many, many years ago. Now they're both of blessed memory. Venerable hierarchs and clergy of the ecumenical throne. Ambassador Bennett, congratulations on a, a superb service to the government of Canada, to the quest for religious freedom, and your own personal ministry. Because I can see that ministerial passion that comes through in your presentation. And, and If I may, the concept of stewardship as an archon is paramount. Time, talent, and treasure. And I encourage the archons in the United States to read the scripture every morning. You know, we Orthodox have a daily epistle, a daily gospel. Well, through divine providence, I have to share the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, which was today's reading. If I may, remember, Archon Stewardship, the Cheerful Giver. Brethren, and it's an iPad, or I should say an iPhone app, you can, get, you can download this. Brethren, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And that's our guiding principle. Because we have a very, very awesome and serious responsibility as defenders of the faith. And we do so with great joy in our heart for having the privilege to do so, and to fight for the religious freedom of the ecumenical patriarchate. As the good ambassador said, it's not only the ecumenical patriarchate that's under attack, it's all Christianity that's under attack. Our same references, the Pew Foundation, 70% of the world's 7 billion people are under religious oppression. Through almost three quarters of the entire world does not enjoy the religious freedom that we enjoy in the United States or in Canada. Only a mere 30% do. When we talk about global Christianity, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. 32% of the world's inhabitants are Christian. 23% are Muslim. And you can see the percentages on the far right. Christianity, Islam, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jews. Christians in the Americas. 86% of North and South America is Christian. In the United States, 79%, population of 320 million. In Canada, nearly 70% is Christian. radiologist, and that was my office. <laughs> In Europe, three quarters are Christian. In the Middle East, the population is much smaller. Almost 4% of the population in Northern Africa and the Middle East is Christian. And when we talk about Christianity in the Middle East, we're essentially talking about Orthodox Christians in the Middle East.
because we Orthodox comprised roughly 66%. Protestants, 7%, and Catholics, 27%. In the, at the turn of the century, in the night, early 1900s, Christians comprised 10% of the Middle East population. 2010, I don't have more recent figures, half that. The same thing in Constantinople. At the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, we were 20% of the population of Constantinople. 20%. This is the percentage we are today. Not even a tenth of 1%. Why has the Greek Orthodox population been decimated in Turkey? The answer is quite simple. The pernicious, egregious, heinous, chronic policies of the government of Turkey. You saw the interview heard around the world. It truly was heard around the world. That famous question, do you feel your all holiness that you are being crucified sometimes? Now think of how courageous it is for the ecumenical patriarch in Turkey where they throw people into jail, they ban YouTube, they ban Twitter, there are more journalists thrown in jail in Turkey than any other country, yet our courageous, intrepid ecumenical patriarch was brave enough to say in his own country, yes, I am crucified in Turkey. That did incite an introspection in the newspapers the next day. Maybe it's true we're crucifying the patriarch. This is some of the images. Now, if, I won't, if there are anyone who has a squeamish uh, sensitivity to graphic pictures, I recommend that you close your eyes for a few seconds. But look at this representation of a crucifixion. Not a literal crucifixion in this case, but when you fast forward a couple of years, in fact there are crucifixions of Orthodox Christians in Syria, in Iraq. This is what's happening to Christians in the Middle East being murdered, executed. Your reference to Miriam Ibrahim, an Orthodox Christian, an Orthodox Christian. The desecration of churches, icons. The two hierarchs that we pray for every day that have been kidnapped 18 months ago. The constant intimidation, vandalism of churches, grenade thrown at the patriarchate. When we as Americans go to the ecumenical patriarchate, we are harassed, our passports. When, when Pope Benedict was there a few years back, we had to walk a mile and a half, 125 Greek American Orthodox Christians had to walk a mile and a half, including my 88-year-old mother-in-law who could barely walk. They confiscated our passports before letting us get into church. The, the harassment and the, the persecution and the, the, the constant intimidation of Greek Orthodox in Turkey is something that we bring up everywhere, and we'll get into what the archons do. We've, we've even, or the government has even uncovered plots to assassinate the ecumenical patriarch. If you look at the ecumenical patriarchs of the past 500 years, it's a very disturbing observation by the well-known British historian Sir Stephen Runciman, who wrote The Great Church in Captivity, 
Look at these statistics. Only 21 of the 159 died of natural causes. Two thirds of our ecumenical patriarchs were thrown out of Turkey. 17% were abducted, abdicated rather, abdicated. We talked about the two abducted bishops. These abdicated and six, six were killed, had violent deaths and of course, if you do a little bit of research, the most well known is of uh, the ecumenical patriarch Gregory V. A month after Bishop Yeramanost sought freedom from the Ottoman yoke, the Turks, and I'll read this to you because it's so moving, strenuous exertions were made to fit out a force to crush the rising at its center, the rising war of independence of Greeks. Meanwhile, as this would take time, the Sultan determined by a signal example to strike terror in the rebels. According to the law of the Ottoman Empire, the Orthodox Patriarch was responsible for the good behavior of his flock. On the morning of Easter Eve, this was Holy Saturday, Holy Saturday, a decree was issued deposing the Patriarch and ordering the bishops to proceed at once to the election of a new head of the church. The Synod, which met immediately after the morning mass, had no choice but to obey. And while the new Patriarch was receiving the investiture of his office, the Venerable Gregorios, still in his sacred robes, was led out and hanged before the gates in his own palace. So this was a predecessor of the ecumenical patriarch, hanged in his own house. So think of that. Think of living there every day, and think of that the, as a predecessor. His body was taken, was dragged out through Constantinople, and finally thrown into the Bosporus. The execution of the Patriarch was worse than a crime. It was a mistake. It was intended and taken as a gauge of defiance, flung down to all Christendom. And then the Russian government withdrew its ambassador. Now every April 10th, the ecumenical Patriarch goes to the gate, now welded shut, where the hanging took place, and commemorates that awful, heinous act by the Ottoman Turks. The suffering of Christians in the Middle East was the subject of the joint declaration that just took place a couple of months ago, May 25th, when His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch, and Pope Francis prayed together, commemorating the 50-year anniversary of the lifting of the anathemas the following year, the meeting of Pope Paul VI, who was in the process of being canonized, and Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras. And I draw attention to the highlighted verbiage from this holy city of Jerusalem, we express our shared, profound concern for the situation of Christians in the Middle East and their right to remain full citizens of their homelands. We especially pray for the churches in Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, which have suffered most grievously due to recent offense. And what are the principal issues of the religious freedom deficit? And there's a huge religious freedom deficit in Turkey. These are the issues. In the eyes of the government of Turkey, the ecumenical patriarchate, and all other religions, quite frankly, does not exist. 
They have no legal bona fide personality. When you don't exist, how do you buy, sell an appropriate property if you don't exist? Now you're right, Mr. Ambassador. Last September 30th at the Yigford dinner when the Prime Minister at that time and the Ecumenical Patriarch had dinner together, these so-called great democratic reforms were announced, which were woefully inadequate. Woefully inadequate and quite frankly, I have to say, disingenuous. He said he would return properties. That has not happened. Just a trickle of properties have come back. A trickle. In 1936, the government of Turkey required all churches and charitable institutions to register their properties with the government. So we registered about 8,000. Not all the properties, but the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the adjoining churches. By 1999, we had less than 2,000, the others being confiscated by the government of Turkey. By 2014, we had less than 500. And some of the properties that we own, I have to say, are prime properties in modern-day Istanbul, on the Bosporus, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. That's the reality. Another problem in the religious freedom deficit, the government of Turkey takes it upon themselves to interfere in the canonical election of the ecumenical patriarch that we feel is inspired by the Holy Spirit, not by the people in Ankara. And what we're talking about is not just an administrative interference. This is our faith belief. We believe as Orthodox Christians that the Holy Spirit inspires the Synod to elect an ecumenical patriarch. How, what do they do? In 1923, they established a so-called Tuskeri that requires Turk only Turkish citizens to be ecumenical patriarch. And then in 1970, they added further requirements that interfere in the election of the patriarch, going so far as to say that if they don't follow our rules, the prefecture, which is another term for governor, will by virtue of his office appoint a patriarch. So wherever Turkey looks, I have to say, the Order of St. Andrew is there, and I'll get into that. We talked about the uh, non-recognition of the ecumenical status. Since John the Faster, the 6th century, the term ecumenical has been used by all leaders in the free world, except Turkey. And of course, the forcible closure of Khalki. 43 years, 43 years. And you know, many times the government will say, we're getting ready, we're getting close. Nothing has happened. Metropolitan Opidophoros, who's now the dean of the school. And I'm glad you mentioned the historical significance. This is on the sacred ground of the Holy Trinity Monastery established by St. Photius the Great. St. Photius sent Cyril and Methodius to Christianize the Slavic people. This was a tremendous historical significance of Kalki, and yet it remains shuttered. So what have the archons in the United States done? We have a, a number of initiatives that we have executed and continued to execute day in and day out. At the White House, on numerous occasions, we go, several times a year. I'm glad you pointed that out, uh, Evangelos, and I want to commend him for, where are you? There you are. You have done such a tremendous job today. I really salute you and respect you for what you're doing under the guidance of your beloved Metropolitan Forgiveness. But he is a religious man. 
and having those beautiful icons, and I recognize some that the ecumenical patriarch has given, and I see Father Alex's icon here there as well. So it was, it was very gratifying to me to know that this is a religious man who holds such a high position, the former chief of staff of President Clinton. We go to the, the congressional committees, the Foreign Affairs Committee, and Andy Manitas is our man who coordinates that, an archon in the Washington area. We have also done this to each of the 50 state legislatures, and I respectfully recommend in your provincial governments to develop a plan to bring up a religious freedom, religious freedom resolution in each of the provincial governments legislatures, as, as we have done in the United States. It's a, it's a tedious process, but it's one of education. You educate the government, you educate your parishioners, you educate everyone. So in 2008, we had 19 resolutions in 16 states. Six years later, representing 90% of the population in the United States, 42 states with 52 resolutions, we've passed. The red states haven't done anything, Idaho, Montana, New Hampshire. The blue states have introduced legislation but has not passed it. And we have Archon Stefan Georgeson working on that. You serve the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. We work closely with them. We see them several times every year. Turkey is a tier two country. There are several Tears. The worst violator is a CPC country, a country of, of particular concern. A tier two is a watch list, second worst, and then they have other designations. When there was heightened concern that St. Sophia would be converted into a mosque, the original great church of Christ would be converted into a mosque, we we spent two days in Washington, USERF, White House, House and Senate, uh, to change American policy. And this statement came out, and we were concerned because May 30th, May, May 30th is a Turkish holiday, as you can probably imagine why. And uh, the, a, a, a profound statement came out of USERF stating that the Prime Minister, Yusuf urges Prime Minister Erdogan to publicly reject the bill and affirm that Hagia Sophia's current status will be maintained. We go to Europe. This was an extraordinary historic meeting when a sitting Vice President of the United States spent several hours with His All Holiness at the Ecumenical Patriarchate. It, it, it focuses the world's attention on religious freedom by his mere presence at the Fanar. So this is something when, when dignitaries and foreign leaders visit the Ecumenical Patriarchate, it's so crucial because it focuses attention on what religious freedom deficit exists in Turkey. We also go to Ankara. This is Dr. Gormez. He is uh, in the Dianet. The top, he's, in, he's the president of the Dianet, the top religious administrative body in Turkey. And we bring up these issues. 43 years is enough for hockey to be closed. And we, and we bring lawyers with us, and we have data to support our claims of religious freedom uh, violations. Here, Bless you. And I must comment, you know, it's, I feel a connection here, Mr. Ambassador, because your name is Andrew, the first called apostle, so the order of St. Andrew, so I think we have something in common there. And I would like to publicly invite you to our functions in the United States on, on religious freedom.
But we work very closely with the religious minorities in Turkey. Who are they? Protestants? Do I have a... Yes, I do. Now, this, this is from the Jewish faith. This gentleman, Burmak is his last name, is from the Alevis, 17 million Alevi Muslims in Turkey. We have Roman Catholics, we have Armenians, we have uh, Protestant, the, uh, Minnie Ildrum. Have you worked with her? She is extraordinary. The EU, the European Union, has a rotating presidency every six months. When we are able to, we don't do it twice a year, but when we are able to, we, vi we visit and have meetings with the presidency nation. And then we have a close uh, coordination with the uh, uh, attorney Kistakis and Deacon Billis, who's also an attorney, on the fight to return patriarchal properties with parliament. In the actual parliament, the Archons of America organized. Do you think it's easy? From halfway around the world, it cost a half a million dollars to bring people, fly them over, put them in a hotel, and have them speak at, at, on religious freedom on the ecumenical patriarchy, the issue. It, it brings world attention to this. And then three years later, we had another one in Berlin, Germany. This one, the theme being tearing down walls. What better city than Berlin, Germany to have a theme tearing down walls? Each time we brought politicians, diplomats, human rights advocates, scholars, each time we had around 200 participants. Great speakers, of all faiths, of all walks, of all nationalities. Now I want to point to this person here. He was and is the Turkish justice who was on this European Court of Human Rights who voted with the, with the unanimous majority to return the Principos Patriarchal Orphanage back to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And we had him as a speaker. It was, it was wonderful. This person here is the managing partner, director, of the Brookings Institution, a major think tank in Washington. Tearing down walls. Well attended. Fancy, you see those backdrops? We had them made here and shipped to Berlin. Metropolitan of Bithophoros had an excellent presentation on Khalki. This is a German, this is a Turkish human rights lawyer, and this is the top floor of the German Reichstag, the, the Bundestag, the uh, parliament. Jay Sekulo, religious rights uh, uh, leader and fighter, who just received the Athena Gordas Human Rights Award. George Rakis was the chairman, assisted by Judge Bazanellis, Chris Tratakis, and John Zavitanos, all archons from New Jersey, New York, and Houston, Texas. Bishop Catry knows some of these attorneys who's worked over the years. Now, last night at dinner, His Eminence mentioned the connection that the Canadians have also with Ground Zero, New York, and Ellis Island. So many Greek Orthodox came through Ellis Island first and then uh, went north to Canada. Well, this past Saturday, just two, three days ago, the St. Nicholas Shrine ground blessing took place. St. Nicholas was a church. The building was built in 1832. It became a Greek Orthodox church. The first divine liturgy was 1922. About 70 families are members of the church. And it's the only religious structure that was destroyed by the Twin Towers and the terrorist attacks by the extremist, extremist Muslims that destroyed these Twin Towers. This is how 
Our church reacted right away. The original church was a small church, the new church, and I have to publicly acknowledge the Herculean efforts of our beloved Father Alex, who did not stop in his work in getting this done behind the scenes, talking to the politicians. It took us 13 years to do, including a, a lawsuit that was filed against the New York Port, Port Authority. And now the, the, the grounds were blessed with holy water, with water taken from the memorial. And the two memorials are fountains of water from each spout, nearly 3,000 spouts of water into the memorial pond, each spout representing a murdered soul. And, and those are the victims' families. They're the only people who could take water from this fountain. And, those, and that water was used for the Ayyazma. This is the actual service. And going back to the Old Testament, two cairns, a, 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 a compilation of rocks were placed solemnly. And it's, it's a tradition that goes back to Joshua in the Old Testament, paying reverence to uh, in memorial of some uh, of, of an individual, and here representing the various ch church bodies, philoptikos, archons, and other great benefactors had the privilege, and the archons had the privilege to lay a cairn into uh, a rock into the cairn. It was an amazing day on Saturday, and we had the opportunity to write our family names on the foundation of the church. That's what the church will, be look, will look like in about two and a half years. And it's in the prime location at Ground Zero. These are the, this is the reflecting pool, and if you can envision it, it's comprised, there are two, two of these where the void is, of the, nine, of the Twin Towers, and there are little tiny spouts, 3,000 of them, representing the, the murdered victims. And this came from Western Pennsylvania, part of the foundation, this was a huge steel beam uh, with a Slavic cross. There are a lot of Slavs in Eastern or Western Pennsylvania. And it says, St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah, but that came out on the day that the governor signed. Nobody knew that. No one knew that. We never ordered it this way. But once the governor said that we were definitely building at ground zero, the next day disappeared. It's amazing. So somebody working in the steel mill who was Orthodox Christian wrote this on by himself. No one knew about it. Now, there are a lot of resources to learn about the religious freedom crisis. Become informed. The website of the Ecumenical Patriarchate is a great source of information. The Metropolis of Toronto website, and Vangelic, congratulations, you're doing a great job with that. The Order of St. Andrew, our website is chock full of information. You can subscribe to our newsletters. We're on the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, YouTube. We have a wonderful uh, uh, magazine that was developed for Sunday School called The Zine. Our annual report, which you have here, that summarizes the activities. We have a newsletter that we publish periodically. And I'm pleased to announce that the Archons are, are organizing a pilgrimage to the Ecumenical Patriarchate at the same time as uh, Pope Francis of Rome will be visiting for the patronal feast day of St. Andrew. So at this time, I again express my deep appreciation to His Eminence, Metropolitan Sotirios, for the invitation and for the uh, honor and opportunity to present these serious issues regarding religious freedom and the ecumenical patriarchate. 
You know, we work closely with our exarch in the United States, Archbishop Demetrius of America, our beloved Father Alexander, who's our spiritual advisor, who we work so closely and are on the phone with all sorts of mornings and late at night. And I have to salute you, sir, for the work you're doing. We're so proud of you. The Metropolitan told us about you and your visit, and we're very thrilled that Canada has such an important position in your history. And you know, we started a conversation with the Archons of Canada last year, so it's a privilege to be in your company again, and we thank you so much. And our, I always salute our uh, National Vice Commander of Blessed Memory, who has given the order literally millions of dollars over the years to sustain the efforts. It's a very costly program, but it's one that is effective. Now, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, let us defend our Mother Church. Thank you very much. <laughs>